let me start by saying that um, when we look at our society today and we see um, the uh, craziness that, is, that comes to us from the, uh, the narcissism in chief uh, in the White House, uh, the narcissist in chief in the White House, um, uh, many people wonder, how did we get here? How did, how did this happen? Um, and um, there are, a, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but basically my contention is that um, uh, there's a tremendous amount of pain in this society, a tremendous amount of pain. And the liberal and progressive forces um, get part of it, but miss other parts of it. So I, I'm starting by talking about the problems of the liberal and progressive forces and why we are not more successful in this country. Not to say that we aren't have, don't have some successes, but on, um, on the large scale, um, even the issues that we take up, we haven't really made much difference on. Let's take the most important one, or the way that the, uh, the liberal and progressive forces focus, is primarily on the vast economic inequalities in this society. Yet when you look at over the course of the past 50 years, you see that there has not been any improvement uh, in the fundamental gap. Uh, if anything, the gap has grown larger between, uh, let, I mean, the, the figures are astounding, but you know, just one, that there are five super billionaires who own more wealth than the bottom 50% of the population, okay? Uh, that, that's unbelievable that it's that way. And that has, has been true, um, increasingly true, um, across Democratic as well as uh, Republican administrations, uh, including times when Democrats had control of both houses of the Congress as well as the presidency. Um, so something is wrong here. Something, there's a, a big problem here. Um, and um, uh, there is not enough sense of success on the part of liberals and progressives to even actually end the problems that they talk about or that we talk about. Uh, so let me say that also that in talking about some, uh, some of the problems of the left, and by the left I mean all those liberal and progressive who believe that government has an important role to play in uh, dealing with the problems that, are fa that we face in this society. And by the right I mean all those who believe that the, uh, the competitive marketplace is the way that um, all the problems will be eventually be solved. Um, so that's the rough way I'm using those terms, left and right. Um, so um, before I say more about the problems in, um, in the left, I wanna say that I've been involved for 55 years as a social change activist. There hasn't been a year that I haven't been very much involved, uh, including being uh, here in Seattle as one of the teaching at the University of Washington until I was fired as um, after I had been indicted by the federal government for, um, for uh, organizing a big anti-war demonstration in 1970 uh, in an organization that I had founded called the Seattle Liberation Front. And is anybody here in that time? Anybody remember that? Um, yeah, so anyway, um, I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm, I'm only saying that to say um, that um, I don't look, I know that most of the people in the liberal and progressive world are wonderful people, have been brought into social change activism uh, for the highest and most wonderful reasons. And um, so please do not hear anything I'm saying to mean uh, to be demeaning of people who have been in these struggles. But we have some problems that I, I wanna talk about. Because the, um, so, the, the problems mostly stem from the logic of capitalism. And, um, uh, and I'll say three elements, I wanna talk about three elements of that, the materialism, uh, the individualism, and the meritocratic fantasies that uh, capitalism engenders. Um, by ma the materialism, I mean that 
um, capitalism emerged in a struggle against um, a previous form of oppression, namely feudalism. And feudalism was an outgrowth of previous forms of oppression, slavery, and so forth. So um, actually, we've had, uh, for the past 10,000 years, various forms of, um, of, of uh, domination and oppression of people ever since class societies and patriarchy developed. And, um, and so capitalism is not the origin of all of them. It is the inheritor and uh, refiner of it. It's the most refined form of oppression that uh, we, that is to say, the smartest, the one that is um, most successful because it has made the ordinary people the agents of an oppressive society. Um, and um, so, um, and it has a certain, a set of belief systems that are critical um, in dealing with the, um, the church and the, um, the previous um, uh, forms of oppression that exist, existed in, um, in societies that were um, uh, oppressive societies that were justified by beliefs in God that, and a, a God or a gods um, that were validating the existing oppression. Um, capitalism adopted a, a, a form of materialism that said this, that that which is real is that which can be verified through sense datum, like your eyes and ears and touch or whatever, uh, or at least measured, and if not actually, then at least in principle can be uh, um, experienced in that way. And everything that uh, is not that um, is really what we now call, dismiss in a dismissive way, nonsense. The, okay? The, that term nonsense that is used to mean nothing that deserves respect is part of the ideology, the, wor the worldview of capitalism. Because what, the, now let me clarify this a little bit. The, the, um, the adoption of this worldview of, I'll call it, let's, let me call it a religion for a second, but um, the, the, um, has uh, had wonderful impact in regard to science. Um, as a result of the development of science, we have had great innovations and um, really important um, ways of dealing with a whole set of physical problems. And um, so in the past 400 years, with that focus, science has made many, many important and wonderful contributions. But there is also scientism as opposed to science. Scientism is taking this worldview and saying it's not just about the physical world. It's about everything. It's about all parts of human life. That this, this is the criterion of what can be taken seriously. And because of that, um, um, a great deal of what it is to be a human being has been discarded or at least um, pushed to the side, um, made to feel um, that it isn't uh, real. What, are, what am I talking about? Ethics. Ethics, no ethical judgment can be verified through sense datum or um, or uh, measured, not even in principle. Uh, similarly, um, any form of spiritual life has been um, regarded as something that has no place um, in any kind of public discourse. Uh, similarly, um, all caring for other people, um, caring for the planet, these are all things that are um, are um, relativized and, and essentially we are told they have no place in our public discourse. They can't be verified, they can't be. Um, now, the, um, that application of the scientific method to all of human beings, okay, first of all is a colossal failure because science has not been able to and in principle will not ever be able to actually grasp with what it is to have consciousness. It doesn't, it, it, can, it can describe correlates of the brain that accompany consciousness, but that's not the same thing as grasping what consciousness is. And, um, uh, but 
the, um, so the uh, scientism is a religion. Now, why do I say it's a religion? Um, because like all other religions, by its own, its foundation is a belief system that does not, has nothing outside of it, okay? And so, for example, when, um, uh, if, if we were to ask, take the founding statement of scientism, um, that everything that is real can be verified through sense datum or measured, that founding statement cannot be verified through sense datum or measured. <laughs> do, you, do you see what I mean? That's, a, that's, in other words, it's a belief system, but it's so deep in our consciousness, and so many of us think through that worldview now that it's hard to get beyond it. But this has had a negative impact on the left because ever since Marx, and maybe even before Marx, um, um, the, um, the left has taken a materialist worldview um, in, regard, uh, in regard to human needs and assume that once we could deal with people's material needs, um, people would embrace us and be excited about us. But it turns out that people have other needs that the, the liberal and progressive forces have not uh, been adequate to, to deal with. How do I know about these other needs? Well, apart from the fact that almost everybody I know has them, um, <laughs> um, I should say, say this, that um, after uh, losing my career as a philosopher, which is what I was teaching at the University of uh, Washington, in very big classes, thousand, a thousand people in my classes, um, which made my co-philosophers uh, very upset with me. <laughs> um, there was, um, I, bec I became a clinical psychologist and was um, awarded a, um, a set of grants from the National Institute for Mental Health. And in the process of that, got to, uh, and those grants were to study the psychodynamics of work and family life. So I had an um, amazing opportunity through the institution that I created called the Institute for Labor and Mental Health um, to study along with uh, a staff of other therapists uh, and union activists and social change people um, to study the psychodynamics of middle income working people and we've been studying it ever since. And, um, and what we learned was that um, people have, working people have other needs, including amongst them, a need for meaning and purpose to life. A sense that they want something more than to have their workplace be um, focused entirely, on the, that their work is entirely about making money for the, rule, the owners of corporations uh, with a little of it trickling down to, in the form of their salaries. Um, we, st we went to the labor movement uh, um, because we were working with local lab uh, uh, labor unions um, and uh, what we found in our studies, we went to the national leadership of the uh, AFL-CIO and said, you know, um, people, uh, wor your workers want something more than just, um, as the workers were telling us, a compensation for a wasted life in which they hoped that they would, at the end, have saved up or had a, a, a pension uh, uh, good enough so that when they reached retirement age, they could then do something that they found of meaning as opposed to what they had to do with the rest of their lives when it was focused on earning money. Um, so, um, so the la leadership of the labor movement and later people in uh, left organizations basically said, nah, that can't be true. Now. Um, they would say, you know, for example, that uh, working class people only come to the uh, union meetings um, when there's contract negotiations, but you can't get them there the rest of the, uh, the other parts of the two or three year cycle. Uh, we brought this back to um, uh, hundreds and hundreds of people in our study and we had small groups that, let, uh, that went on for eight to 10 weeks and in those we brought it to them said, this is what they're telling us. Okay, from the top, from the very top. And um, they responded something like this. If that were true, 
How do they explain why we fill up the churches on Sunday morning? Because the truth is, we don't get any money out of that. It's not true that all we care about is maximizing our money. We actually want something different. And the reason we don't go to those labor, labor union meetings is they are incredibly boring, and they're mostly about um, a parliamentary procedure to validate the, the power of those who have been put on to us from the national organization or, um, or factions that are running against each other. It was, it's, makes no sense to us. There's nothing happening there. So yeah, we go to the, when there's contract negotiations because we want compensation for a, a life, a wasted life. But it doesn't mean that we don't actually have something that we want very different than this. Uh, you see what I'm talking about here? Yeah, okay, so, um, so it turns out, and at first, by the way, our, our team of therapists and uh, other professionals who are doing this, um, st these studies um, didn't believe what we were getting at first because so many of, of us upper middle class people who had or professionals, et cetera, had been trained to believe that we had meaning needs, but they, the, the, the great working class of America, they only have material needs. It's not true, but it is true that the left by and large has been confined to um, economic entitlements and political rights as, as the major focus of their attention. Now, don't get me wrong, I am totally and remain totally in favor of those struggles for economic entitlements and political rights. Uh, in fact, even more so, as you'll see when you read the book, um, many plans to expand those rights and expand these, those economic entitlements much, in a much more um, loving way. Um, but um, that's not how the liberal, uh, the liberal and progressive world is perceived outside of itself. And so um, it's perceived as somewhat one-dimensional in respect to those issues um, in that they never talk about other elements of what people want in their life. Um, and, what, uh, and what that turns out to be, and we learn, learned this in the study, was some sense that people, others, respect them, care about them, uh, see them as fundamentally valuable, and treat them that way. Now, that was not their experience in the liberal and progressive, progressive world. Um, now, to understand that, um, we have to understand um, that um, many of the people, 60% of the American public, okay, still sa says that they go to church once a week, uh, once a month. Now, this is probably not true, okay? <laughs> but that they want to feel perceived in that way is already an important reality. But, but what the people we were talking to revealed to us was the deep religiophobia that they encountered in, in the left. That is, um, the sense that, here's what uh, uh, several of them told us in one form or another went like this. We know that, um, that um, when it comes to election time or when it comes to a big demonstration that you want to have, the, the liberal and progressive forces want us there. They appeal to the churches, they appeal to religious people and say, come on out, be there with us, vote for our candidates, etc." cetera. But um, apart from that, they, give us the sense that they, they want us in their movements and to, will tolerate us there as long as, number one, we don't bring any of those religious uh, uh, values into, um, into our um, movements. And number two, um, we hope, and we, we really hope that those religious uh, or spiritually oriented people will evolve eventually into the much higher level of consciousness that we, the rest of us, have so that they will be able to leave the nonsense of their religion behind and become, like the rest of us, people who don't have any kind of spiritual practice in their lives and hence are not dealing with 
reality, because reality is only that which can be verified through sense datum or, or um, measured. Do you see what I'm talking about here? Now, this was a, an a, so this was a revelation for most of us because we began to understand how they were experiencing it that way, and um, and that was helping us explain why people who agreed with the, the liberal and progressive programs were nevertheless moving to the right. Now, moving to the right did not start with Trump. Um, in the um, in the past. 20 to 30 years, um, most of the state houses have been uh, dominated. Most, that is, most states, uh, state governments have been dominated by Republicans. Um, and, um, and so if we need, if we want to uh, deal with the environmental crisis, which is going to require dramatic um, uh, legislation, and in, the, in uh, uh, the book Revolutionary Love, we put forward a, um, a very, um, uh, let's say, uh, powerful <laughs> um, uh, change mechanism, the uh, Environmental and Social Responsibility Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Why do we need an amendment to the U.S. Constitution? Because the, um, any legislation passed by, let's hope, a new progressive uh, Democrat and a progressive Congress will be overturned by the Supreme Court. They're, they have no hesitation. They are ideologues who know, who know what they believe in and say it clearly. And we're, um, that's why they were chosen by the, uh, by the presidents. And um, some of them uh, even uh, val uh, you know, validated by uh, Democrats in the Senate who voted for, for them. But in any event, um, we're not going to get the changes that we need in the environment until we can have a um, fundamental uh, changes in the Constitution that make it possible. I'll get into that a little bit later, or the book really goes in, into what, that, uh, what the ESRA is about. But in other words, we are going to have to talk about those people who have um, left the left who have moved towards the right. Now, let me make it clear um, that, that a lot of the people I'm talking about are people who've moved there, not because they agree with the, poli the politics of the right, but because they feel put down and uh, feel disrespected in the liberal and progressive world. And there's a lot that makes that their experience. So um, now, I know when I speak to um, groups of uh, activists, they often say, I don't understand that. I don't know what they're talking about. We don't disrespect them, et cetera. But you know, um, this is like uh, other forms of when groups report, uh, let's say, racism, sexism, homophobia, xenophobia, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, et cetera. Um, you have to listen to the testimony of those who are the recipients of those kinds of behaviors and not the, the, the protestations of, for example, white people about racism or um, men about sexism. No, you have to listen to what the people who are feeling it, okay? Because this is what they are feeling and experiencing. And consequently, um, uh, and, uh, and sadly, because of the, um, the materialist consciousness in the, in the left, and materialism here meaning um, all those things that can be verified through sense datum and so forth. Um, you see programs that come forward that are narrowly focused on, um, on entitlements that are good things. I want them to win. I want them to be the case. But they're not, we're not winning, and they are not the case. Um, I mean, I, just to, to take one example, they, um, the people in the left seem to think that if they have the right program, if they, if they get the right program articulated in the right way, um, that they'll win back the people that they need to win back. Well, it's not true, they won't. Because they don't understand that for a very large number of people, they don't vote on the, on the basis of the program. They, they don't vote, or at least not solely on the basis of program. They vote in part on the basis of heart not just mind, 
In other words, we have to speak to the hearts of people and show them that we care about them. But actually, that's very hard to do right now because so many people are so outraged at, and rightly so outraged at, um, at the right and at the, particularly the, uh, the Trumpist right, um, that, they, that we have dismissed all those people as, um, well, here's the, the common theme that you'll hear from activists uh, of all sorts. Um, uh, why is it that we're not more successful? It's because the American public is racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, uh, Islamophobic, anti-Semitic, or stupid. Now, um, how many people have ever heard this? Okay, but here's the shocking news for you. It's not just that we're saying it to each other. The rest of the society hears it. They hear it, and what they hear is, this is the contempt that I experienced when I was in the liberal and progressive world and why I moved away from it, and it's still there and flourishing in a very big way. Now, if you were not, let's say, an activist today, um, you didn't have contact, you were not part of an organization that was articulating liberal and progressive ideas and so forth, um, and you wanted to pick one person to hear, that you would listen to to say, okay, this is what the left believes. Most people who are not connected to left or the left in any way, and by the, as you, I, I gave a, a broad definition of the left, that's about 50 to 60 million Americans that I'm talking about, because it's the left culture. And this culture is a culture that, that repeats to itself that the reason we're not more successful is because of that. So, but the, what we don't recognize is that the rest of the population hears this. And so they say, okay, who would I hear uh, speaking the truth about what these people really think about us? Answer, well, let's see who they choose for president, uh, their presidential candidate. So here's a story that um, uh, uh, from, um, you probably know that Hillary Clinton said some version of, um, at least half of the people who are not with us are a, um, a bundle of deplorables, okay? Now that was, you know, you can say, wait a second, she didn't really mean that, or she took it back, or she, she was misquoted, or whatever. But that, she actually did say, say that, and have it on tape, and the, the right, it was a field, you know, it was like um, a, the biggest gift that the right could have possibly gotten from from the, le from the left for discrediting them, okay? It reconfirmed people's sense that these people th think we're deplorables. I'll give you one little example of one of the people that um, we interviewed um, in after the uh, 2016 election um, was a woman who had gone to work in the, in the red states. And she, um, she stayed at a friend's house and she, at, uh, two days before the election she went she was going to go home to her home state to vote. But she turned to her friend that she was staying with and said, it's been very hard talking to people here. I haven't made a lot of progress, but I hope at least you are gonna vote for Hillary. So the woman said, um, well, I'm not really sure yet. I haven't made up my mind. So this, the woman that I'm talking about said, um, well, look, I know, I'm smart enough to know that if you're saying that, it's because you're probably gonna vote for Trump and you're embarrassed to tell me. So the woman said, no, it's not that. Um, and I, don't, I really do agree with more of you know, what you stand for than what Trump stands for. But I want you to know one thing. I am not a deplorable, okay? So this, maybe this news to you, but this is how a very large number of people in, in this society who are not with us have moved to the right, not because they are, agree with the racism, sexism, homophobia, et cetera, but because of they feel put down, dissed, made to feel like they are not valuable people, that they're not res respected. Um, you see what I'm saying here? Okay. Um, so that has to change. That has to change. And in fact, um, in the book and uh, and what follows from the book, we're trying to create a movement that we call a love and justice movement that eventually will take over the Democratic Party if we're successful, um, that brings love into 
the forefront as something that we believe in. And love here meaning not just the love between two, uh, two people. It means also um, what we call the caring society, caring for everyone. Caring for everyone, not only in the United States, but on the planet. Caring for every human being. Um, affirming positively that we are one with all of humanity. Now, let me also uh, be clear that there really is a core of right-wingers in, uh, in the Trump constituency who are racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, anti-Semitic, uh, Islamophobic. All of that is true for a section, uh, a significant section of the, uh, of the Trump voters. So I'm not, I'm not talking about them. I am not thinking that we, in the short run, are able to win them to a different uh, philosophy, um, not at least in the short run. But there are a lot of other people there who wouldn't be there if they felt that we cared about them, that we respected them, and we talked this way. But we don't talk this way. Um, there hasn't been a single presidential candidate or a, um, anyone who is identified as leadership in the Democratic Party, who is saying, I want to repudiate what Hillary Clinton said. We do not believe, we do not believe that you are all a bunch of deplorables. We think that even though we disagree with some of the policies you're following, um, even though we, st we strongly disagree with those policies, we nevertheless recognize your humanity and your fundamental decency and goodness and want, precisely for that reason, want to show you why that, re, that reasonableness, that decency in you ought to eventually lead you to back the programs we're putting forward. But nobody talks like that. Nobody has apologized. Nobody has spoken a, langu a, a language that addresses those people and says, come back, we want you, we care about you, and we, are, and we have sinned, we have made a big mistake, we are sorry that we have had a certain degree of elitism in our ranks that, um, that then acts like you are less than th they are. And similarly, with regard to your religion, it's true that, um, that there are many people in our progressive world who are not religious and don't, don't believe in God. Um, okay, but that doesn't mean we think that you are any lesser smart or valuable because you do. And we want an alliance with you and affirm your, your value to us and to the world um, with different uh, views on questions that are not verifiable through sense datum and measurement. Do you see what I'm saying? This is a very different, this is a very different way of, um, of talking that is not out there in, in the democratic ranks. Um, and the materialism, the, the, has uh, contributes to a narrowness of focus um, and uh, in the Democratic Party, so that the um, uh, this leads to the pr present moment. This this um, I think uh, s eventually self-destructive move on the part of um, the D uh, Democratic Congress to impeach um, uh, impeach the president. Um, there's no one. Even, in the, in, even those who sup strongly support what the Congress is doing right now, who believe that the Senate is going to um, oust um, uh, the president. If the Senate did oust the president, it would be a gift to Trump because he's gonna run again and be reelected if that were to happen. Um, so, but the thing about these, so why, why am I opposed to the, or why do I think that there's a, not opposed to it, but think that, it's, that the way it's done is a terrible mistake. They have chosen the most narrow possible focus on some kind of, you know, oh, he's using money to uh, ch change um, uh, actions of a foreign government for his own interest. Well, isn't that what the United States has always been doing with our money? We always give, uh, our, whole, uh, uh, our whole attitude towards foreign aid has been, we give money so that we can control other countries and get them to so, uh, open their gates to our large corporations. And, uh, may, you know, and we use our military to challenge those countries that don't open their gates to our, uh, to our corporations. Do you see what I'm talking about? So this is the most 
narrow possible way thing to to uh, focus on as uh, when if you're going to do that if you're going to use that as your opening leverage then also include as one of the uh, uh, as part of the um, charges against the president that he has authorized and um, uh, and commended um, people in his administration to engage in kidnapping of little kids in the, on the border, taking them away from their families, okay? He has, okay, that's just one. He has dismantled the pathetic, already somewhat pretty pathetic measures that past administrations made to try to protect aspects of the environment, and he's dismantling them, hence a threat to all life on the planet, okay? Um, and uh, he has dismantling right now, he's just taking away food stamps from, um, from hundreds of thousands of poor people. These are moral outrages. Why aren't they included as the basis for in impeaching him? They are the kinds of things when you start talking to the hearts of people that people respond to as opposed to some manipulation in, uh, in uh, uh, Eastern Europe, it's crazy, okay? The, why not, why not, because the Democrats don't think about talking in terms of your heart. They only think about turn, talking in terms of your head. So they've, they've got grounds for in, impeachment, but they have, no, they have no mass understanding of the psychology of people that would make them respond and say, yes, we've got to do it. You see what I'm saying here? This, but this is only, uh, 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 a, a, a um, representation of the narrowness of their consciousness, okay? Of the consciousness of, um, uh, that is formed when one asks, well, how do we verify it? How do we prove it? How does it, you know? <laughs> there are so many things that are, um, that would speak to people's hearts and we're not sp uh, speaking enough to people's hearts. Um, now, to, I want to go a little bit further in, in direction here and talk about the individualism, that, the second component of the capitalist worldview. Because that, what the capitalist worldview teaches and what people learn every day in the world of work is you're out in a world where everybody seems to be looking out for the number one. And consequently, if you want to be successful in the world, then you also have to learn the skills of looking out for number one. Um, and this is, um, uh, has been a part of previous class societies as well, as well but it is much more refined now. So that when people, um, not only do they experience that in the world of work, sometimes it's not just individual workers, it's the work group, but the competition um, between, between groups um, leads to the same outcome, which is people feeling everybody's just out for themselves. Um, and uh, this is dramatically reinforced by the media because almost every show that you'll see, well, it's obvious in the uh, reality television shows, right? Uh, Trump was one of the, the shapers of reality television, but people have been putting many other shows like it. You're in a situation where everybody has to fight against everybody else in order to win. Um, it wasn't, it's not just there, it's in football, it's in the, you know, the professional sports, et cetera. Um, there's a sense of um, everybody's out for themselves, looking out for themselves, maximizing their own self-interest without regard to the consequences for others. But in that world, when people um, buy that that's how it is, they, go, they bring that, those values home into their personal life. And so it becomes more and more difficult to sustain loving relationships. Okay, the, the ethos of the marketplace is brought home into personal life. People act in very selfish, materialistic ways, toward, not only towards the rest of the world, but even towards their families in some ways. And so we have the highest level of divorce of uh, any country in, in the world. And this huge um, problem that even when people don't get divorced, they're not sure if they're, you know, the, the, I mean, it's only 50%, maybe it's le less now, only 45% of the population uh, of marriages end in divorce. But 
Um, most people don't know whether they're in that 45% or whether they're going to be in the other. So there's a great deal of insecurity in relationships. It used to be when you got married, it was going to be, it was going to last. It was a thing that you could count on. Today, people don't have that feeling uh, that, uh, that marriage will last. They have a, a great deal of in, uh, insecurity, uncertainty about that, and it makes them feel scared. Now, we ask people, look, um, uh, when, how do you like living in this kind of a world? How is, how is it for you? And the answer mostly we got was, we hate it. Then we said, okay, if you hate it, um, what are you doing to change it? And they said, change it? It can't happen. It can't happen because uh, everybody's just out for themselves. So we said, okay, um, is this true of your friends? Let's think of your five to 10 closest friends. Are they really just um, out for themselves and care about nothing else but maximizing their own self-interest. And most people responded this way. No, it's not true about my friends. It's just true about everyone else. <laughs> okay? So understand that it's not just the, the media and it's not just the, um, it's not just the messages that they get from parents early on that you're going to face a very tough world out there and you've got to learn to protect yourself and people are just out for themselves. But it's all, uh, it's all of that is true, but it's also dramatically reinforced by all of us because we ordinary people s um, tell this story to other people that the this is how the world is. And, um, and, so, and they rarely talk about, add the part, and I hate it. They rarely add that part because then they would be feel feeling that they would be seen as, in, uh, as uh, unrealistic, okay? Um, now, here goes the issue of what's realistic and what's not realistic. It turns out that every major change that's happened in, the, um, in my lifetime, in the, 20, in the 20th century, happened um, uh, because a small group of people decided that they would fight for something that everybody around them told them was unrealistic. Okay, it was ending segregation. Well, you know that Martin Luther King was surrounded by other ministers who told him to stop these demonstrations against segregation, that it wasn't gonna get any place, it was just gonna make people be more angry at African Americans. Do you know that? Maybe not, okay. Well, but it was nevertheless it's true. Um, um, when the uh, small groups of women in Berkeley and San Francisco and Seattle and Portland and uh, and Ann Arbor and, uh, um, and in uh, Bo Boston and New York and Washington came forward with the idea that women should oppose the patriarchy. Most other women said to them something like this, dear, do you not know that patriarchy has been there for the past 10,000 years and you think you can change it? You, who are you? You know, women in your 20s, 30s, you think you can change that? No. Well, and what I say is, thank God that those women refused to be realistic because, because um, the changes that actually have occurred, while not yet ending patriarchy, have made such dramatic advances, not just in this country, but almost every country in the world now has a, um, a consciousness about sexism and an opposition to sexism that was just a brand new reality in the world, okay? And everybody told them, be realistic, and they refused to be realistic. Um, similarly, the struggles against apartheid in Africa. Similarly, when uh, uh, gays and lesbians said, we wanna get married, okay? Everybody, including so many people in their own movement said, it'll never happen, it's just impossible. Um, okay, here's the story about being uh, realistic. You never know what is possible until you struggle for what is desirable. You will never know what is possible until you struggle for what is desirable, okay? So if there's a religious message I wanna give you, it's believe in the possibility of possibility. The world is not fixed because human beings are not like um, material reality that is stuck in a particular uh, inevitable um, repetition of how it is. Human consciousness allows for freedom, and that freedom allows people to transcend who they were at one point in their life and become uh, um, 
to evolve in a variety of ways. And so when people say to you, oh, he wants a world of love? Forget it. That's never going to happen. Um, uh, what we say is, well, uh, I hope you'll get this book, a Revolutionary Love, because it, it does, um, it, it lays out these ideas. I'm giving you a very um, shortened and uh, somewhat vulgar presentation of ideas that are far more sophisticated than I'm presenting here, because I tried to give some, some of an over, somewhat of an overview of, uh, of all this. But you'll see that this is well thought out over, um, and I hope that you'll read it and, um, and get other people to read it. So the individualism is part of, the, of, of what um, makes people feel alone, alone even in relationships, feeling alone, feeling insecure, not sure, sure if people, you know, if your kids are going to be um, faithful to you or care for you when you're in your old age, if you're uh, um, the individual, because they're, they also have learned to look out for number one. And so that doesn't mean looking out for their parents. It means themselves, okay? Um, so this, this is part of what contributes to a huge amount of pain in, um, in the society. People feel lonely, even in relationships. They feel they don't know who they can count on. Certainly not anybody outside of their immediate family, they think. Um, and, that, um, and that is part of the problem that they're facing. And the liberal and progressive world never addresses that and helps them understand where these um, perverse ideas come from in, um, by the way that this society is organized to, in, to uh, reward individualism and selfishness. Finally, there's the meritocratic fantasy, and this is very, very important. Um, most people have come to believe the central justification of the, of the inequality of wealth and power in this society. That justification uh, is the vision, the claim on the part of the ruling elites of this country that you're living in a meritocracy. A meritocracy means a society ruled by merit. So if we are in the top 20% of, um, of um, wealth holders and um, income receivers, <clears throat> um, we believe that we have been, we are here because of merit. We worked harder than those other people. We're smarter than those other people and the society rewards us. Now this idea, I wish it were just held in the right but it is also held by many, many liberals and progressives. Um, and uh, not because they hate other people, but because they feel like this is um, a, a reward that they deserve, that they, um, they did work hard and, they, did, uh, and they, they were smart, they did use their mind and so forth, and they got rewarded for it. And hence, they don't wanna hear about anything about changing the fundamentals of the system because they think, wait a second, a system that has recognized me and my value is a, you know, that's something. I, I have, to, have to support a system that sees me as so valuable that they are rewarding me financially and in other ways with, um, with what they've rewarded me for. Okay, so this makes it very hard for people to go to the step of saying something really needs to be changed in the system. Um, now, for the bottom 50 to 60% of the population, 50% living, for example, on, um, uh, on less than, um, depending on the, um, the, if they lost their next three um, paychecks, they would be in dire straits and possibly out on the streets. This is, the, people have very, very little in the way of savings that they could count on, okay? Now, for a very large section of the rest of the population, what we discovered was that almost everybody carries with them a self-blaming story. And the self-blaming story says something like this. If I hadn't done X, or if I were not um, Y, okay, I wouldn't be in this mess. I didn't, okay, now fix what goes into X or Y. Well, X goes like, um, I didn't work hard enough when I was in high school. I screwed up in college. I, I, didn't, I didn't take it seriously. Um, for um, many women, 
the, and the, the why part is if I had been born more attractive or if I had, um, or if I had um, uh, kissed the behind of my, uh, of my first few bosses, I would, I would have been much more successful. I'm sorry I didn't, wasn't able to do that or whatever. Or, and that, because that also goes for men too in their in jobs. Um, people have very detailed stories of where it is that they screwed up that made them not have uh, more, the success that the society says, and their, and their parents were continually trying to tell them this, that they, they could be successful. They could be much more successful if they studied hard, if they worked harder, if they did X, Y, and Z, okay? And that, then the school system teaches the same, same meritocratic fantasy. Just, you know, sit down, work hard, and you'll, but the truth of the matter is, and the, the New York Times ran a series about this in 2008, showing that there had been almost no um, mobility anymore, that a tiny percentage of the population is able to move up the class ladder, but the vast majority of people cannot move up that class, class ladder because it's not like you could have um, 50 million people being bankers, okay, or whatever. You know, there, there, there's a class structure here, and the class structure is what keeps people from um, uh, any kind of serious um, transformation of their situation. So, uh, the, um, so the, but how often do you hear, uh, even Bernie doesn't talk enough about a cla the class structure um, and certainly doesn't challenge the meritocratic fantasy uh, that is out there. Yet this is critical because that self-blaming is very, very deep. In fact, it hurts so much to have that self-blaming story that people repress it. They don't even want to know about it themselves. They have a self-blaming story and then they repress it out of consciousness. So in our groups, we were able to eventually uh, um, have people feel safe enough to talk about this, about how this worked. Because at first they were denying it. Oh no, I don't have anything like that. But then somebody in the group would first tell their own story of where they were blaming themselves. And other people would say, well, that's ridiculous. You shouldn't feel that way. And, and soon what happened in the groups was other people started to open up and talk about what, they, uh, what their self-blaming story is. And we found that this is true, not just in um, poor or uh, lower income working people, but really across the class ladder. Um, even people who are professionals have um, uh, keep a, uh, a self-blaming story going uh, about why they're more not more successful as professionals, et cetera. So, but this hurts tremendously. And so people try as much as they can with their friends. They don't want to have their friends see them as failures. So they don't talk about this. They don't, even their close friends, they try not to talk about those feelings that they have of inadequacy, failure, uns and so, this contributes to the tremendous pain. And as that, the, the um, generations have gone on more deeply um, absorbing this, and with nobody helping explain to them what, where these ideas come from and why they are not true, and why they're not true about them, and why there is a class structure, and why there's limitations, um, you see now people, um, first of all, men, uh, middle-aged men dying at a much higher rate than ever before, so that this is a country where um, right now um, the, uh, the age of death is going down rather than up. Did you know that? That, that, the, that, the, um, that um, people are dying earlier in this society than they have been before. Um, and that very large numbers of middle-aged men are um, engaged in suicide or in uh, in alcoholism, uh, drug, ab drug abuse, opioid, the opioids thing, all of this is a manifestation of great pain that people have and look, uh, look for ways to um, deal with that pain. And one of the, the ways that they learn to deal with that pain is to become members of right-wing groups who externalize that pain and say, yes, you're in pain, but you know why? It's because of those others 
those African Americans, those, uh, those um, immigrants or those refugees seeking asylum or now, right now, I, I mean, you're seeing it happen against Jews also. The anti-Semitism in the country has popped up and uh, out of wherever it was hiding when it, the, you know, since, since uh, Trump made that famous statement that there, there are good people on both sides, the people who are resisting the, the fascists and the people who are fascists. There are good people on both sides. So, um, so you have uh, more and more externalization. So, that, so that's one of the ways that people externalize that pain. So the task is to address that pain. And part of what I'm talking about, and a lot of what's in this book, are ways to address that pain. Um, in fact, we are, um, we are training people now to be um, what we call um, uh, in prophetic empathy. What's prophetic empathy? Empathy is he hearing other people's stories and validating them as fundamentally valuable. And uh, that's an extremely valuable thing to do because it helps people overcome some of their self-blame. But um, we, prophetic empathy is also simultaneously telling people about the structures of oppression in this society and, and why they can be overcome and why they should not blame themselves for, for that. And um, so prophetic empathy, we have, um, so we've started trainings um, is there anybody in the room who happens to have been in that, one of the trainings with Kat Zavis or, okay, anybody? No, I don't think I see anybody. I'm not, um, all right, oh, you, you were, huh? And uh, is, is that true? Yeah. What? In the past. Oh yeah. Um, so, uh, um, so we're trying to train people with a, um, we're calling them uh, empathy tribes, of groups of people who work to bring empathy now, our first goal, however, is not to bring empathy to the right, but to bring empathy, a prophetic empathy, to the left, to the 50 to 60 million people who, um, who have dealt with the frustrations and pain in their life by um, actually othering um, people who are not just like them or people who um, are religious or people who, are, um, who, are, uh, who have moved to the right, but voted for uh, Obama in 2008. Um, so um, part of the, the task is to speak to people, speak to their hearts, and validate who they are. Um, so the meritocracy is very important, though, to uproot. And unfortunately, that means challenging uh, the pop psychology and pop, pop spirituality that has as its message, you created your own reality. And you're, and now, look, I'm a psychotherapist. Um, people, I, I work with people um, in part around the ways that they are limiting themselves. Or, um, and so it's certainly true that there is an element of truth in each of our lives, that there are things that we could overcome um, with a good therapy, or with a good spiritual practice, et cetera. But it's not true that most of it can be overcome that way. There's a real society out here. There's a real structures of power and, uh, uh, and um, economic inequalities that can't be overcome by you working on yourself. And so when people say, oh yes, well, you know, I'm, I'm doing that. We're gonna change the world one person at a time or you know, like this crazy notion that, you know, or we're gonna change the world by uh, recycling our, our, I'm for recycling, but no, that's not going to change the, the destruction of the planet is going on because of the tremendous uh, desire on the part of the rich and the, and the corporations that they control to continue to grow and uh, grow and may be bigger and bigger and sell more and more stuff. And that means taking more and more out of the earth as though this was a bottomless cookie jar, this planet. But it is not a bottomless cookie jar. It is a limit. It, it has limited resources, and we are growing in ways. And uh, the the um, dynamic of the capitalist market requires growth. It requires that they, that it won't work unless uh, they can. Pr each corporation can prove that you're going to make a lot of money by investing in it. And so they are continually having to expand. <sighs> this has to be changed. 
it has to be changed or there won't be a planet. I mean, well, there'll be a planet, but it won't be, a, the life support system of this planet will be destroyed, at, is being destroyed at this very moment. And, um, and it's gonna take much more sweeping uh, steps. So let me just mention in that regard, um, the um, environmental and social responsibility amendment to the Constitution. Actually, wait, I'll, I won't say that first because I want to go back to, just to the last part of the meritocracy because um, to just say one other thing. When people are having these self-blaming stories, okay, and somebody comes to them and says, you created your own reality, it just reinforces their self-blaming, you see? And when people turn to them and say, or when they hear left people saying, um, uh, all men have privilege, okay? And, um, and so you ought to learn how to renounce your privilege. All white people have privilege, so you ought to learn how to renounce your privilege. Um, what they hear is, you're not good. You, you're bad, you're part of an evil system. Most of the men that we, uh, we interviewed and most white people responded to this in, um, I think I'll, I'll read you just something from the, from the book about um, some of the responses that they had had to this. Um, to, to, to what? Pardon me? Okay, yeah, I'm reading something from the book um, that of responses to the the sense that they had from the left that um, um, that the left was saying um, uh, that they're bad that they're bad people because they're men or because they're white. Um, so um, here are some of the, the, the people that we interviewed. We have their actual words here. Um, the, the shaming and blaming that they felt when that, when that happens. It happens, by the way, very much more intensely on the college campuses than any place else. And it's left a lot of people feeling like, I don't want anything to do with politics if politics is about making me feel bad about myself. But um, here are some of the interviews we did after the, 2016, after the 2016 election. Tom Marconi, age 34, assistant manager of a fast food queen, uh, in Queens, New York. By the way, the names were changed um, to protect the identity of people. I agree with everything that I heard um, about the need for uh, changing inequality um, and, oppor uh, and oppression, um, re uh, oppressive relations. When I went to Occupy, uh, Occupy Wall Street in New York um, in 2011, but then I heard people talking about white men being the oppressors. Well, I'm a white man and I felt like they saw me and everyone like me as evil beings yet they know nothing about my life, my struggles, or that I come from a very poor family. Okay, here's Samantha Brown, 59, um, uh, office worker in Chicago, Illinois. I'm an African-American woman and I face plenty of racism, but not all whites are racist, and many of those I've met and are anti-racist. How do you think this country elected Barack Obama tw twice I'm not, going, I'm not going to be part of a movement that makes white people feel that they have no right to speak or be spoken or be taken seriously just because they're white or, um, or old. Yet I still see that happening in liberal and progressive circles in Chicago. Here's Letitia Jones, 67, retired nurse, Oakland, California. I was, uh, um, I was active with, a, with the Black Panthers for many years worked serving breakfast for children in East and West Oakland. The Panthers created an alliance with white stu students at UC Berkeley and thought, um, and thought that was great. I, and I thought that was great. Now it's decades later, later and these days, these, um, I hear people talking about white oppression. So I, allow, uh, so I ask, uh, always ask, what about class oppression? They never mention that. And it actually, I don't think they even know what I'm talking about. So now I am active in a social action committee of my Allen Temple Baptist Church because where people of all skin colors and rad racial backgrounds are welcome. Here's Louis Bernstein, Lois Bernstein, 
33, elementary school teacher in Austin, Texas. One of my friends told me, today it's liberals who are the establishment and they make me feel like shit. Okay, this is a quote from her. Uh, they're always saying things against um, whites and they make me feel, um, feel terrible. They're, um, uh, I want to support my husband. He has a very difficult job, works hard, respects me and the kids, and I'm supposed to see him as bad because he is white and male. That's je je that gets me angry. I used to be a Democrat like everyone else in my family, but now I'd even consider voting for Trump. Okay, here's Janet Davis, 29, tech worker, Washington, D.C. I spent several weeks in my birthplace. Oh, well, here, I've told you this story already. I'm not gonna, all right, so I'm, I'm saying this is, these are just random samples of um, many of the interviews that we did with people. Um, and what, um, so imagine you have this self-blaming story, you feel bad about yourself, and then you encounter people on the left who are telling you, you really are bad. <laughs> you know, and really, probably we suspect that the reason you are where you are is because you're stupid. Because if you weren't stupid, you'd be with us. Okay, well this, let's say that you really, I'm, now I believe that there are probably people in the room who hold this view. Okay, what I want to say to you is, even if you hold the view that they're all stupid, it's a stupid way to do politics. <laughs> okay, you are, because we are pushing these people into a camp that is really reactionary and can do terrible evil, is already doing terrible evil, okay? And we are pushing them in that direction. So even if you think they are somewhat screwed up or whatever, um, we have to approach them in a different way. We have to find ways to heal that screwed upness rather than simply revel in our superiority and our being in a higher place than them. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. Um, now, um, empathy, prophetic empathy, as opposed to, see, empathy doesn't allow for judgment. It just allows for acceptance. We want to both validate people and also challenge them. Okay, that's what prophetic empathy is. It's not simply validating. It's validating and challenging. Um, and how to do that is something that requires training and that's where, why we have um, these trainings that you'll um, find um, the next one I think starts either in January or February. It's online, it's live online and you can be part of it. Um, and other people you know can be part of it. Um, but the book, okay. Then it goes on, okay, what's your central, what, okay, this movement, you, you said, Michael, you said that there's going to be a movement for love and justice. Well, what is, its, what is its central point? And here's what its central point is. We need a new bottom line. We need a new bottom line. Today, um, every institution, corporation, our economic system, et cetera, are judged efficient, rational, and productive to the extent that they maximize money and power. The, the love and justice movement says no, we need a new bottom line that says that every institution, every corporation, every government policy, our healthcare system, our educational system, our cultural systems, um, every institution has to be judged efficient, rational, and productive to the extent that they maximize love and caring, kindness and generosity, ethical and environmental uh, sensitivity and behavior, seeing other human beings as embodiments of the sacred rather than looking at other human beings primarily from the framework of what they can do for me, or what they can, how they can help my plan to see them as fundamentally valuable. And looking at the earth not simply as something that gives, uh, that provides raw materials that can be turned into a, pro a product, uh, a commodity that we can sell, but looking at the earth as our mother, as something that deserves care and respect and evokes from us awe and wonder and radical amazement at the grandeur and mystery of this earth and of the universe of which it's part. That's the new bottom line. Um,
If the liberal and progressive movement were to talk this way, it would win over very large numbers of people who have been pushed away from us. Now, a lot of the book then goes into detail about what this will look like in different institutions. You know, how the, for example, if you want to care for um, families and care is your primary focus, you want the caring society, caring for each other and caring for the earth, then we're going to have to short, dramatically shorten the work week so that people have more time with their children, more time with their families, um, and, um, and not cutting their, uh, their financial, um, financial needs, I mean, not, not cutting their salaries in ways that make it impossible for them to live. So we're going to have to talk about a 28-hour work week, um, 28 hours, seven, four days a week, seven hours a day. Um, that would be a huge, you know, I know that your first reaction is, oh, it'll never happen. That's what people said about the 40-hour work week, <laughs> you know? Um, okay, we have a zillion such proposals. I mean, they include, for example, reparations for slavery. We want African Americans to receive reparations for what they went through, for what their families, what they inherited from the, the age, of, uh, age of slavery. And there are many other things specifically addressing the needs of African Americans in this society and other people of color. Um, but uh, I'll just mention the envi environmental and social responsibility amendments of the Constitution, which in the first section uh, of it um, uh, abolishes all money from politics except money that is allocated by the state or state legislature or the uh, federal government equally to all major candidates. Um, but no other money. So if you're a rich person, you can't use your money in a campaign. You're, you're, you're barred from, uh, and, or if you've got rich friends, they can't, you can't um, bring that money in, in. Money is barred from the campaigns except what is given equally to all major candidates. Um, and um, the, uh, um, another part, part of that first part is it abolishes the uh, electoral college and requires that election, the president is elected by popular, uh, popular vote. And, it also, um, it does many things to make sure that it, it, it requires that every citizen is, every person living in the United States it, uh, is given the right to vote automatically in the ch when they're born. They don't have to register for it. And all they have to show is that they're born, born here or that they have become, become a citizen. And um, uh, that um, anybody who can, uh, conspires to limit people's ability to vote um, faces serious jail time. Okay, so that's for a certain sector of the um, uh, Republican Party that is trying to do that right now. Okay, anyway, the second section, however, is, deals with the, um, so that's uh, the democracy part. The second section deals with um, changing the work world, and it does this in the following way. It requires that every corporation with incomes above $50 million a year, so we're not talking about mom and pop corporations, at least not at this stage. We're talking about the big corporations, that every, any corporation with incomes above $50 million a year must get a new corporate charter once every five years, and that new corporate charter will only be granted to those that can prove a satisfactory history of environmental and social responsibility to a jury of ordinary citizens who receive testimony from people all around the world who have been affected by the operations of that corporation. Why a jury of ordinary citizens? Because we've seen how um, agencies that are set up to, um, re uh, to um, provide regulations for corporations end up being staffed, not just by the Republicans, by the Democrats. Democrats have done this over and over again. Um, Obama did it. Clinton did it. They put in the, into those uh, institutions people from the very, uh, the very corporations that these, uh, these, that these uh, regulatory bodies are supposed to regulate. They say, well, hey, we have experience. We know how it works, so we'll be good. We'll, no. Okay, this is, we're not going to set up, 
uh, we're going to overcome that by giving ordinary people the ability to make a determination. And, um, and if they don't get the new corporate charter, they can't continue as a corporation. Okay, they don't have any of the, the rights of a corporation. Um, another part um, also uh, requires that corporations have at least 50% uh, of their board made up of um, partly um, elected representatives of the workers of the corporation, and the other part, uh, representatives from uh, environmental organizations that have been fighting for environmental rights um, before the ESRA was passed, uh, not the ones who are in phony environmental organizations created after, you know, to, uh, to get those positions. So corporations have a board that is at least 50% um, responsive to the needs of, uh, but, um, okay, so, and there's more. It requires, it requires uh, um, environmental education from grade, um, from kindergarten through graduate school every year at a grade level appropriate to the, that grade. Um, environmental education about what's happening so that uh, the denial is, um, the denial of it and the refusal to understand that it's rooted in the uh, elements of the capitalist system that is put, put in there. It also requires that um, corporations that seek to move, uh, you know, like uh, Boeing threatened to move out of the state if it, um, if, uh, if uh, various restrictions were put on them. Do you remember that? Yeah, and okay. What? Yeah, Th that all of that would be illegal in the in this is made made you can't do that um, unless you present an environmental and social impact report and then a a, a, a committee of a, a a jury of ordinary citizens gets to decide um, how much they have to pay in reparations to the country the city that they're in if they want to move any of their things to some other place. Do you see what I'm saying? So. There's a lot of detail. I don't want to go into all the detail. But in other words, um, this is not um, just uh, um, some, whatever, let's say, dismissible, n n um, I, I hesitate to use the word new agey because there are a lot of good people doing new age stuff. But um, it's not silly stuff. This is not just, um, it's, been, it's been thought out very thoroughly and it has a Pro, a set of programs about what it would be like if this new bottom line were there. And, um, and in fact, it also has in this final chapter um, a vision of what the world might look like 100 years from now if after 50 years of environmental destruction, which is I think what we're on path towards in the last half of this century, the next half of the, uh, the first half of the next century will be filled with people who say, yeah, we need a new bottom line and we're gonna construct a society based on that new bottom line and uh, what, what that world would, could look like. So um, I, I, um, I wanna say two sort of more pragmatic things. Number one, I wanna pass around um, a sign-up sheet so that I can be in contact with you after tonight. And when you sign this, um, Two things. Number one, you are not signing that you're joining the organization. You're not signing that you're donating money. All you're doing is saying, yeah, you know what? This guy had something interesting to say. I think I'd like to hear more. Um, and I'd like to hear what they're doing and like that. Um, uh, the second thing about this sign up thing is that um, you've got to write your name and email in a way that as though you were writing it to a six year old. Because, because I'm the one who has to take these names and emails and put it into uh, um, a, um, a, a computer. And if, I, if there's one, one vowel or one number that I can't read or that's in, indecipherable, um, the whole thing doesn't work and I never hear from you. And I'm not able to communicate with you anymore. I really want to communicate with you. So I'm asking you to, before you leave today, to please um, sign, um, uh, give me your name and your email. And I promise you, it will, you, you won't be getting, um, uh, you, you know, you won't, you can, anytime you can, you can stop getting it. But 
uh, please let me be in touch with you if there's anything that I said that makes an, any sense to you. Um, and the second thing I want to say is that um, before we go to Q&A, I want to go back to you talking to somebody you don't know and just for about five minutes um, share, or maybe less, maybe three or four minutes, um, just share if there's any part of this that made sense to you. What was anything that excited you about this presentation? Anything that made, turned you on about it? And if you can't think of anything, then you can say to them what, what you thought was stupid or irrelevant or whatever, okay? But before we go to Q&A, I'd like you to talk, turn to somebody, somebody else. Um, and I'll just say, stop my presentation by saying, thank you for listening, okay? Yeah. Okay, it turns out that, um, that we don't have much time left. <laughs> um, and I do want to, um, I want to sign books for anybody who will buy it. By the way, it's a great gift to give for a holiday to people, people who you agree with or people who you disagree with. Either way, you'll find it a, um, a rather wonderful gift. Um, but, but actually, I really want you to read it yourself first before you give it to anybody. Um, and I'm going to go over there and sign. So who wants to do, is there somebody who wants to say something? And we have two microphones, one here and one there. So is that one there? So, um, so is there somebody standing there? One Hello. Two? Okay, go. Hello, Rabbi. Hi. My name is Naomi Finkelstein, and I'm an organizer with the Poor People's Campaign. Great. Wonderful. And um, what resonated with me with, about what you said was that it resonates with a lot of economists. So Manfred Max Neef, the Chilean economist, Amatra Sen, the Nobel Prize winner. Um, and it resonates with the disability justice movement, for instance, Leah Lakshmi's P. Epsna's uh, Care Workbook, which just came out which talks about mutual aid. So I say all this to say, as a poor Jew, uh, and who's observant, um, there are in fact uh, factions of the materialist, as you would say, who have been talking about human needs for at least the last 25 years. And building whole movements about that and not building economies based on the GNP. And then there, as a poor Jew who is a queer, who was thrown out on the streets of New York City by my Orthodox family, I can say that, you know, there's a lot of shtick. And I think mostly what I want to say is, did you build upon those works, including Bookchin's social ecology work, which talks a lot about this? And also, um, did you, I mean, my thing is, I think people aren't listening to poor people. Not, not on the left, not on the right. They're just not listening to poor people because we know what would help us. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for your thank remarks. Thank you. And, um, and I agree with you in almost everything you've just said. And I, uh, also, I've been, at, uh, I've been going to the poor people's demonstrations, and it was a real um, struggle for me not to cancel tonight uh, uh, this whole trip to Seattle because there was, it was happening yesterday in, in San Francisco. In San Francisco. Right. Mm -hmm. I really yeah. wanted to be there. Yeah. Uh, and we interviewed, um, in Tikkun Magazine, we interviewed... Um, Re uh, Reverend Barber? Reverend Barber mm -hmm. and... Uh, um, Liz Theo Harris? What? Reverend Liz Theo Harris? Too? No, just, mm -hmm. just Barber. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, although I would like to also ha have her. But I'd like to... Um, but in any event, um, we're totally aligned with them, totally supportive of them. and. Um, what I'm trying to do is to bring all those people that you're talking about together to cohere in a way that has a enough of a unified voice that they could actually have an impact in changing the political system of the liberal progressive world. So they could change the Democratic Party. Um, I mean, yeah. You know, um, just as the right wing took over the Republican Party, yeah. the love wing has to take the love wing has to take over the Democratic Party. Thank you. Okay. Oh, back there. So um, I, I was very appreciative of the discussion about how people are driven away from the left and driven away from progressive ideals. Yes. The phrase that comes to my mind, which I read often, is we're elitists. You know, we, we know better than you. 
Um, that's kind of the phrase that comes to mind. So I wanted to kind of talk about the education issue um, and college for all. Um, we know that roughly 40% of Americans 25 to 35 are college educated, have four year degrees. 30% 55 and older. What does the college to all mean to the seven out of 10 Americans that don't have a college degree? What does that mean to the six out of 10 Americans that don't have a college degree that are 25 to 35? I think it says a message. And I think that message says we're not, our job if you go to college is better than your job. I think that message is based upon what you're saying is go to college, be like us progressives. I think that's something that maybe we need to think about a little bit on the left side. Your thoughts on that, that observation? Um, well, I, I basically agree with you. I also think um, the number, okay, my experience as a college professor um, un until my career got ended by J. Edgar Hoover but, uh, was um, this. The main thing that college teaches kids is to hate ideas. The, the, the main product of college education is to create anti-intellectuals anti who, because, they, because so much of what they're given in college is stuff that has no meaning to them, has no connection to what they really care about, um, but they stay there because they know that it's a path to better jobs. And, um, and so more and more then they, they um, they end up, so college is a very mixed bag and, um, and I certainly don't think that we should be acting as though everybody has to go to college or, or it's better for people to go to college unless colleges change in some fundamental ways and we have some suggestions about how to do that. But I'm sorry that we have to stop now. The, 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 what's happening is that the workers here have to go home and they feel like, um, so what we need to do is to um, sign, I want to sign books for people who are buying it. I hope you'll buy it. I, um, uh, I make about 25 cents on the sale of each book, so I'm not really in this for the money, but I am saying that this book will help you get a lot more of the sophisticated ideas and thought out ideas, and you can share them with other people. And please don't leave without at least giving me your name and your email so that we can continue that conversation. I'm gonna be over there signing books. Um, please come and buy, buy it. Buy it for yourself, buy it for your friends. If you're gonna buy it for friends, read it first. Okay, thank you so much for being here. Thank you.